Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have with me as my guest Dr. Justin Paquette. Dr. Paquette is a neurosurgeon who practices complex spine surgery in Los Angeles, California. Dr. Paquette did his medical training at Albany Medical College. He then went on to complete a residency in neurosurgery at the Harvard Tufts Combined Program in Boston, Massachusetts. From there, he completed a fellowship in complex spine surgery in Los Angeles at Cedar sinai Good afternoon, Dr. Paquette. Good afternoon. Today, I'd like to discuss a fairly common situation that is sometimes called flat back syndrome. Um, Dr. Paquette, can you define what this term flat back syndrome uh, means? Sure. So flat back syndrome respond, uh, refers basically to a loss of the normal curve in the lumbar spine. When you look at an x-ray from the side, in the lumbar spine, you should see a nice C-shaped curve. Okay? What the uh, flat back syndrome refers to is that C-shaped curve is no longer there and can sometimes even be reversed. And so the spine, rather than being curved back at the base, now starts to tilt forwards. The overall result of that is that the whole body itself is now tilted forwards and out of balance. We call this positive sagittal balance. Uh, it essentially just means that the patient is always leaning forwards. The problem with that, the body doesn't like it. And the body wants to bring yourself back into proper balance. And so to do that, all of the muscles in your low back have to try to pull the spine back into position. Now over time, this leads to a lot of pain, not only in the low back, but in the mid back, in the neck, can sometimes cause headaches, uh, and also causes pain and fatigue in the, uh, the hamstrings and the quadriceps. And people will often kind of walk in a stooped uh, um, position with their legs bent in an, in an ultimate attempt to recreate that normal balance. And, and the source of the pain is mostly the muscle spasm that, that this imbalance causes? Or are we getting mechanical pain from the spine itself? It can be both. But in, in, in essence, it's mostly muscular pain, especially when we're talking about the pain that, come, that travels up the back between the shoulder blades, the neck, the head, and the legs. Okay, so most of that is trying to compensate for this abnormal posture. Correct. And those, those, when we start out, those structures are normal. So the neck muscles and the, uh, the hamstrings may be normal. They're just constantly squeezing down, trying to support it. And, then, and, and does that lead to deformity in those other areas? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Uh, in long-standing cases of flat back syndrome, where people have had, tried to uh, accust, um, accustom themselves into that flat back syndrome, you can lead to a variety of things, such as um, uh, shortening and constriction of some of the muscles that attach to the pelvis, uh, sometimes even contractures, which means that they are permanently scarred down in a shorter position to the hips because they've been working all the time. You'll also see sometimes people develop kind of a jut in their neck as they basically try to uh, look in a horizontal gaze to compensate for their overall body being positioned way forwards. Now, how does a person... Uh, become suspicious, a patient I'm talking about, that they may be developing flat back syndrome. Mm -hmm. Flat back syndrome can is essentially uh, be produced by two different situations. One of them is surgery. And we know that if a fusion surgery is done in the lumbar spine without uh, attempts to preserve or create that normal lumbar lordosis and curve, then if, they, if the person fuses forwards and flat, that without a doubt causes flat back syndrome. It can also happen without surgery where there's excessive wear and tear in the discs and the joints in the, in the spine and things start to slip forwards one on top of the other ones. And that also can lead to a loss of the um, normal alignment in the back. The symptoms that people get are however very similar, which is basically very severe and persistent back pain, especially when trying to lean forwards or holding something or picking something up in front of you, uh, standing and walking for any kind of period of time. Uh, and ultimately, the pain that begins in the low back now transcends up the entire back in between the shoulders, neck, the head, and then develops leg problems as well. When a patient with flat back syndrome presents to your office, what's the routine that you go through to try to evaluate the situation? What tests are necessary? Um, and, and what are you trying to accomplish during that first office visit? Sure. So when I initially evaluate a patient in my office uh, with concerns for flat back syndrome, the first step is just the clinical examination. 
and looking particularly at the pelvic girdle itself, uh, looking at the quadriceps, the hamstrings, seeing if they have uh, become contracted, um, palpating the, um, the back itself, which sometimes allow you to feel for um, slippages or, or uh, an abnormal curve. The most important thing, obviously, though, is the, uh, the films, the radiology films. And those can include more uh, in-depth films, such as a CAT scan or an MRI scan. However, one should be able to pretty easily diagnose a flat back syndrome based just upon x-rays that we can do in our office. I would get two different types. One would be a uh, flexion extension uh, x-rays of the lower spine. And what that essentially does is dynamically allow me to see how does the spine move in concert. When you look at an MRI or CT, you're just lying there the whole time. You don't see how the spine moves. Whereas the flexion extension films, we can actually see when somebody's going back and forth. Are there any evidence of spondylolisthesis? Are they moving abnormally, etc.? Uh, and then the other uh, films that I would get would be a, an AP and a lateral or front, back, uh, and side uh, x rays of the whole spine, those scoliosis films we've been talking about. That'll help me to measure the overall balance of the patient's body. And if the balance ends up being too far forwards, that also is diagnostic uh, for flat back syndrome. Now, you, you've mentioned this, this balance problem. Um, treatment, is there any role for conservative treatment in flat back syndrome? Is there anything short <coughs> of surgery that will improve the situation for the patient? As long as the patient hasn't developed any kind of concerning neurologic deficits, and we'll always try conservative therapies first. Those are going to basically be all, any kind of modality that can strengthen the back and help to control the pain of the back. And so some of those uh, things are going to be pain medicines, whether they be anti-inflammatories, um, whether they be uh, muscle relaxers, pain medicine. Um, ice can sometimes help with calming down the inflammation of a flamed back. But by far and away, the most important thing that somebody can do in a situation is uh, physical therapy. Strengthening the core muscles, strengthening the upper muscles, the leg muscles. Not because that's going to change the position of the spine, but because it'll make it easier for the body to um, use the muscles to, to uh, compensate. They won't get as tired as quickly. Um, they won't get deconditioned as quickly. And overall, the patient's condition will uh, be better. What, what do you use uh, to make the decision that conservative therapy has failed and surgery is something that would be in the patient's best interest. What tips your hand to suggest surgery to a patient? Okay. So in the, a situation where uh, the patient's requesting surgery and we have to determine, are you ready for it really? And first of all, I, have to, I find from the patient exactly how much is it bothering them, exactly what is it preventing them from doing? Because we need to make sure that um, it's a significant uh, effect upon their life. Number two is the types of conservative therapy I'd want to see is at least six months of physical therapy and really hard, trying hard and working with physical therapy without an appropriate relief. Uh, attempts to use all kinds of medications, especially anti-inflammatory medications that still hadn't helped. And the patient basically saying that, you know, it is just overall affecting my lifestyle. When they've come to that uh, conclusion, uh, then I think it's reasonable to uh, entertain the possibilities of, uh, of a surgical correction. Now, you mentioned two situations that you can develop flat back. One is as a complication mm -hmm. of previous surgery, and the other is just from the degenerative process itself. Are you more likely to recommend revision surgery, surgery to correct that deformity that was caused by an earlier surgery, than you are surgical intervention for someone who develops flat back from a degenerative standpoint. They've never had surgery on their back. Mm -hmm. um, I think in either situation, the symptoms probably are gonna be very similar. Even the person that had surgery, another person hasn't had surgery, if they both are suffering from the phenomenon of flat back syndrome, they're both gonna be having very significant pain and, uh, and a disability from that. So when I determine whether or not to do surgery, it's actually not important whether they've been operated or not, not before. It certainly makes the surgery a little more complicated if they have been operated on because um, you have to take out the prior instrumentation. You have to deal with some of the scar tissue, et cetera. But the same um, criteria I would apply to both patients. And the surgical correction for flat back syndrome. Can you describe what your goals are when you go into 
uh, operate on a patient who uh, primarily has flat back syndrome and you're trying to correct that? What are your goals at the time of operation? Sure. The two main goals of operating for flat back syndrome are as follows. Number one is to get all the pressure off the nerves to make sure all the nerves at the, at the base of the spine are fully decompressed. And then number two and the most important goal is to restore the person's normal lumbar curve and also the person's normal overall spinal balance. If you don't do that with the surgery, then um, you have not helped the patient because they will not ultimately be satisfied with the outcome. You must restore the balance. And to do that, sometimes we employ a variety of different things, but it would involve uh, more screws um, and then trying to mobilize the spine to be able to bring it back into a normal curve. Now sometimes, depending upon what was done before for surgery, we can do this all by just making some cuts through the joints in the back. And that will allow enough flexibility through what's called a smith Pete or a Ponte osteotomy, just complicated words saying just cutting through some of the bone in the back to loosen it up. That may be enough to bring back the curve and then uh, align the patient into good balance. Sometimes, however, there's, uh, the flat back syndrome is too significant to do that with. And what we actually have to do is a more in-depth procedure called the pedicle subtraction osteotomy. Now, what this essentially means is that from the back of the spine, and all my surgery is done from the back, you go in and basically take out a pie piece cut into a, one of those vertebrae that have been fused in the wrong position. And by taking out that pie piece cut, you can then take the spine and lever arm it backwards into a normal position. And so if it's stuck forwards like this, you make a little cut down through the bone and then close it down like a book and then lock it together with rods and screws above and below. That can give a 30 to 40 degree change in the patient's overall spine position. It can be a very effective tool in, in restoring the person's uh, proper sagittal balance. So really the, what, what you're saying is if you had a piece of wood, for example, that's that's crooked, if you cut a wedge out of it and pull it back and nail it together, then you're better off. Absolutely. Now, unfortunately, you have to do that while protecting all the nerves in the spine because you have to get around mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. to get in there and, and make that cut so that you can then stabilize it. And I'm assuming you're still using the pedicle screws, the metal screws and the rods to strut and hold that spine in the position to where you want it to heal. Absolutely. Now, what should a patient expect if they're going to have surgery um, for flat back syndrome? How long are they in the hospital? Um, how long is it going to take them to heal? Sure. The recovery process for one of these uh, types of surgeries for flat back syndrome is a bit variable depending upon how many levels of the spine have to be incorporated into the surgeon and the fusion itself. But I would say on average, a patient would probably um, have a surgery lasting around four to six hours, would be up and walking the next day, would be in the hospital an average of five days. The pain that they would have post-surgically would be all from the muscle spasms uh, that occur uh, because of the surgery. And as the weeks go on, that would get significantly better. They would note that even just the first day they stand up, they would be much straighter and, and much taller as well. Um, I tell folks that a major turning point in the pain uh, from the surgery is around four to six weeks out from surgery, when they're feeling much better, more mobile, et cetera. And uh, that's when I allow them to get into a, an aggressive physical therapy program, core muscle strengthening, range of motion, flexibility. Certain individuals, if they're doing very well, could uh, drive within a couple of weeks, maybe go back to work within a couple of weeks. Um, I don't think a lot of physicians who are not spine specialists are familiar with the concept of flat back syndrome. And I think that a lot of patients who see, you know, a general physician or perhaps an orthopedic surgeon who is not specialized in spine surgery or a physiatrist for that matter who is taking care of, sur of spine patients but doesn't really uh, do surgery and understand some of these concepts. So I suspect a lot of patients have flat back syndrome and they've been told they have degenerative disc disease or they have back pain and nothing can be done. Do you have any advice for patients who may be suffering from back pain that has not responded to treatment by their regular spine uh, physician or their primary care physician when they should maybe think about looking at, at uh, 
a spine specialist to try to see if maybe this deformity is potentially correctable? I mean, how would you advise a patient? I think you're correct. I think that situation exists a lot out there. Is it just because uh, a certain individual just doesn't see these pathologies that often, they're not going to know to, what to do for when they do see it. I think that if somebody has back pain, um, it's very reasonable to have an internal medicine doctor or physiatrist manage that for a good period of time. If, however, there's no change or no improvement, or if the symptoms get worse, certainly, one has to be concerned that maybe something else is going on. And I think that every patient is definitely entitled to asking for a second opinion. You shouldn't feel uh, that you're hurting the feelings of the uh, original doctor. It happens all the time. And so ask for a second opinion. Say, now, this is what I've been doing. I still have this pain. Is there anything else going on that you maybe, from your different field of expertise, could comment on? Uh, another thing a patient can get is get the written copy of the reports of the x-rays or the CAT scans or the MRI scan and read through that because there may be mentions of possibilities or other, uh, other diagnoses that you have not been told or, or heard about yet. This has been a fascinating discussion about, about uh, I would say, a relatively little-known uh, situation that can come both from an attempt to try to fix someone's back, surgery that actually gives them another problem, and also a little-known problem um, that comes from degeneration that we may just, as physicians, just sort of assume that this is another person with back pain and uh, they're older and they're um, probably going to have to put up with this and there is no solution. Interestingly, I would like to ask one other question. What's the youngest person you've seen with flat back syndrome? Do you see this as a, as a primarily a disease of the elderly, or do you see this in younger folks? I would have to say that in general, this is a, uh, a disease of the elderly or the middle-aged, uh, especially in, in terms of uh, the degenerative process and the fact that most um, older folks are getting lumbar fusions. However, I have seen a few pediatric scoliosis cases uh, who in the past were treated with, say, Harrington rods or uh, older types of um, instrumentation, which ended up <coughs> leading to flat back syndrome as well as the lowest level of the spine started to degenerate, and this was earlier. So the youngest I've probably seen would be young 20s, maybe 20 years old. And do you feel like that you see mostly patients with flat back syndrome who have had surgery, or do you see a mix 50-50? Or do you see a lot of folks, elderly folks, who just have flat back syndrome who've never had surgery? I certainly see both, but I would probably have to say that more often than not, there are people, individuals that have been, had operated in the past. Um, most commonly, it's actually surgeries that didn't involve fusions. People that had some kind of uh, tightness or stenosis in the back, and they, somebody did a laminectomy on the back, which basically means you take all the bone off the back, and sometimes even affect the joints that are there too. We know now that if you take off the whole roof of the spine over time, since there's nothing else to attach to the back and to really hold it back there, over time the spine starts to tilt forward and tilt forward and tilt forward, and that produces a flat back syndrome. Um, one last final question, I think, and that is, is there any specific complications that are specific to, to the treatment of flat back syndrome that you worry about that aren't the normal uh, complications that you would see from spine surgery? There are a few, yes. Um, the whole uh, angling of the spine can lead to uh, some other issues as well. You know, in front of the spine, there's uh, very important nerves and blood vessels that as the spine tilts forwards can get very stuck to that spine. Uh, the aorta, the uh, vena cava, and the, the vessels that come off of those wrap around the front of the spine. And sometimes they can get scarred down and stuck there. If you end up trying to reposition the spine, Sometimes it can rip little holes in those as it comes back. It's very uncommon, but certainly it's something that we look at on the preoperative MRI or CT scans. In addition to it, what also happens sometimes is that the nerves that come out of the spine uh, in the level of the flat back syndrome change. You know, they actually shorten up because the way the, the, the back collapses and goes down, the nerves uh, now have redundant lengths to them. They shorten up uh, as they go into the spine. When you then lengthen the spine again as you bring it back to normal position, sometimes you can cause a little stretch in those nerves and cause a little bit of um, a nerve pain or some tingling uh, for a while postoperatively. 
most of that generally goes away with time? It the body re readjusts to that? It almost always goes away. With time. Okay, great. Do you have any other comments about flat back syndrome that we've not discussed? I think it's, I think it's pretty good. Well, thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks for watching today. If you have questions about the topic that we discussed today or any orthopedic topic, be sure to visit eorthopod.com. And if you're an orthopedic surgeon or healthcare provider interested in participating as a guest on eorthopod TV, you'll also find instructions on how to apply to become a guest on eorthopod TV. Thanks for watching. Music